It's Monday, February 26th. I'm Scott. I'm Rim. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we talk about the ports. Let's Let's do this. this. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I almost forget we even had a Monday show at this point. Well, it's an easy show to cop out on since we usually don't have an idea until the day of. So if we're going to cop out, it's always going to be on a Monday. (laughs) Especially since we do most of our action on weekends. So... You know, even if we have a craziest weekend ever, we'll probably be recovered by Tuesday. Though I will say, we probably, I mean, way back when we thought every now and then about dropping the show down to three nights a week, Monday came up on the chopping block first every time, but you guys seem to really like it. So, yeah, it's like every time we actually do Monday, people are like, woohoo! So, you guys are the reason we're doing it. Uh, Keep it up. By keep it up, I mean listening, I guess, because there's not much else you can do. Yeah. Also, I don't think we're going to have a problem coming up with Mondays for maybe uh, a few months now, so hooray again. Yeah, well, surprisingly, I'm not tired out from the weekend, despite the fact that we played D&D, which... Well, well I think that's just because we had that Saturday of, uh... Well, uh, the way we play D&D, though, is when we play D&D, it's not just a bunch of nerds sitting together playing DDD. It's basically the... DDD? It's basically this D-D-D? epic event... Where once a month the entire crew gets together and yells and screams for an entire day. Well, that's how it is these days, but yeah. Well, as opposed to college where we'd spend an entire day. Every week. Yeah. (laughs) Or every other week. Granted, those bastards drank all my pork, but that's beside the point. They ate the cookies that I made on Friday. Oh, you mean the ones that you hid and then they found because you didn't hide them very well? Well, they, they ate them, and then after they ate them... I hid them away, and I didn't actually hide them, you know, trickily, like, aha, no one will find them. Scott? I hid them, aha, they're not in plain view, so people who walk into the kitchen to eat, the first food they see is probably what they'll grab, and they won't think about it very hard. So they'll see, like, a big bowl of pretzels and just grab some and won't think, where are the cookies? Yeah, except uh, you put it where the glasses are, which is where everyone went, so they all went to get a glass, which I then had to wash, and said, oh... That's where Scott hid the cookies. I will now know where to get a cookie when I want one. Yeah, I figured just, you know, putting them out of sight would also put them out of mind, which did help a little, because I imagine if I did not hide them, that they would all be gone now. We should do what we did at the New Year's party, just tape all the cabinets shut every time they come over. (laughs) I think another plan would be to poison the cookies next time and leave them in plain sight. No, you just make uh, salt cookies. Salt cookies, you say? Uh, It was a prank in high school that someone did. They made cookies, but instead of sugar, they used salt. That wouldn't really work because then caramelization would not occur. Well, they didn't make caramelizing cookies. They made sugar cookies. Uh Uh-huh. Or if you want to make chocolate chip cookies, you can use a substance other than chocolate. Now, I'm not recommending anything horrible, but there are things... Like poop? See, that's not what I'm recommending. Are you sure? I'm quite sure. What are you recommending then? Or instead of uh, vanilla extract, just use vinegar. Uh, But you only put in like one tablespoon of vanilla. Believe me, you'll know. We'll have to test it out. I, plus, I don't want to waste a whole batch of cookie in the effort on poisoning. Well, then you poison like five or six cookies, and you keep them separate, and then you put them on top whenever people it's are It's really over. hard. You, you kind of had to make it one batch at a time. No, no. You just soak them in vinegar or something. Oh. And then let them dry, and then put them back in on top when everyone comes over. So uh. you can eat cookies out of it, because you know the top layer is forsaken. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, of course, now we just told everyone on the internet, including most of our friends. Oh, uh, damn it. However, it'll now be a test of which of our friends don't listen anymore. And which of our friends, uh, you know, will say something about the cookies or think about eating them or still eat them or not eat them. And, yeah, know. I mean, we don't care about all you real people who listen. We're trying to figure out which of our friends still listen. I could put in some sort of non-tasting poison, see who eats them. Uh, what, what kind of non-tasting poison? We're not trying to actually kill him. This non-tasting, non-lethal poison. You're, you're saying x lax Ooh, that's chocolate, too. That's a bad idea. x like cookie, ooh. All right, anyway, it is Tech Day. So, in the news, this happened a while ago, but I want to talk about it because it, while the end result was effectively nothing, it says a lot about the power of the internet. Dell had this idea called Idea Storm, where basically it was dig on Dell's site, and you could submit ideas like, Dell would be better if they did blah, or if they did X, or if they did this differently. And then people could dig up ideas that they thought were good. And Dell said that they would consider and act on whatever ideas got dug up to the top. Pretty much, as you could guess, since this was on the internet and not in any sort of real part of the world, Linux nerds found it and hammered it with, sell Linux, put Linux on your desktops, Linux, Linux, Linux. Yeah, well, you see, the big problem is, and I just realized this uh, recently when I was buying a laptop, when you buy a computer that's already put together, 
It usually has Windows on it or OS X. But if you're buying a Mac, what are you going to run besides OS X? What do you care? But if you're buying a PC, you might be a Linux user. Or maybe you already own a copy of Windows that you bought in a box for your last computer. Or maybe something you use like uh, BOS. Maybe you use BOS. I don't know. But, you know, when you buy a computer, if it has Windows on it already, you're paying for that whether you know it or not. Now, you're not paying the full 200 whatever dollar price, but you're paying for it, you know? Dell pays Microsoft an amount of money for every computer that they install Windows on, and as a result, that must increase the price of the computer that Dell sells to you. Yeah, even though it is some trivial amount, because Microsoft seems more interested in getting you to use Windows than in getting money from you using Windows directly. Yeah, if you buy a copy of Windows at the store, it's like $200, but when Dell buys a copy of Windows, it's like $20, maybe $40. It's not much, but it's still there. So if you're a Linux user and you buy a computer that's put together, this upsets you because you feel like I should be able to buy a computer that's empty or maybe one that has Linux on it where you shouldn't have to add anything to the price see, and why am I paying for Windows I'm not going to use? I see a whole nother layer here where in addition, even if, because Dell's responded, the, the news here is that Dell actually responded to the overwhelming demand for Linux and it was basically three or four paragraphs of corporate wishy-washy, we support Linux and blah, 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 and that's a good idea, thanks for calling, kind of thing. But what I'm getting the impression is that e they, they said, and this is very true, that they don't want to support a single distro, because you know how Linux people are. No matter what distro you pick, you've pissed off 90% of Linux users. Yeah. They should just sell freaking blank computers with nothing on the hard drive at all. Yeah, but beyond that, I, I see, because they did talk about you know supporting Linux and having certifications, and I think one thing that Dell could do that would be really great is instead of selling a Linux distro, or maybe they'd have like one distro that they'll support. But if they sold computers, well, they'll certify and say that all the hardware here will work with vanilla kernels. Mm. Or we've tested and these computers are certified to work with 90% of the Linuxes out there. Or here's a list or of- Or better yet, if they made a Linux distro that uh, and custom and configured it to 100% work with all the features of the machine they put it on. Well, they also mentioned that they're working with Novell. And I could see them making or working with them to have someone make a Dell Linux, which wouldn't be that bad of an idea. I mean, I would install Ubuntu because that's what I like, but, well, I wouldn't buy a Dell anyway because yeah. that's not what I like. But for normal people, if Dell supported it and had it there, I think they could, I mean, I'm not saying that this is some sort of altruistic thing. I think Dell could make a lot of money because more and more, especially with Vista, I'm getting the sense that the mainstream world is, they're not necessarily mad about Windows, but... They're starting to notice the bad press about Windows. They hear about security problems and monopolies and things all the time. And they wonder, hey, isn't there something else? Yeah, the only other two things I got to say about this is, you know, this isn't a big deal for desktop machines because you can build a desktop computer that's blank. So it's not really a big deal that Dell doesn't sell blank desktops. Well, but the only the deal there is that you can't get a better computer if you get it from Dell. But a Dell computer for the same price often comes with a nice LCD and a bunch of extra stuff. And uh, well, it's that if you buy a laptop, you can't make a blank laptop. It, it's almost impossible. All the nice laptops anywhere either have Mac OS or Windows on them. You and can't... they also need Windows for some of their bullshit. Yeah, so it's almost impossible to get... You know, I mean, sure, there are laptops out there like IBM ThinkPads where if you buy them and then you install Linux on them, it'll pretty much just work 100%. Hell, inside IBM, we had an official uh, beta distro of Linux. I mean, I can't really say more than that. That was made for the Lenovo ThinkPads and worked perfectly. Yep. But almost nobody will sell you a laptop with Linux or a laptop with that's blank or and a laptop where you don't have to pay the Microsoft tax. And you know what? It's not like... The companies are evil and, oh, we will deny them Linux. And it's probably not even that Windows is, or Microsoft is strong on that. It's more that it is difficult to make certain laptop hardware work in Linux at all, and it's probably just not worth the effort to them. Just sell a blank one. Why can't they sell it blank? That's all I'm saying. You know, so I don't have to... And the thing is, Dell actually has a laptop you can buy. I think it's either blank or with Linux or with FreeDOS or something like that. And they actually charge more. For the blank Linux non-Windows one. See, now that's just silly, because then I'll buy the Windows one, now I have a Linux license, or a Windows license, and I have the computer, and it costs less. Yeah, but the, see, the thing is, what they'll do is if they charge more, then they'll put out a notice saying, hey, we put Linux on a laptop, and it didn't sell as well as the Windows one. You guys obviously were just lying. 
See, the thing is, I don't think Dell alone, they have no interest in pushing Windows over Linux. They have an interest in selling computers as cheaply as they can to sell to a bunch of people to make a bunch of money. They work with Microsoft because Microsoft gives them a lot of incentive to work with them, and that's where the money is. If the market changes and the money's elsewhere, there's no reason Dell or any of those companies would continue to push Microsoft stuff without a lot of incentive. Well, think about this. You know, every if they just want to sell more computers, it shouldn't cost you anything to sell blank computers as opposed to ones with Windows on them. Here's where it can cost you. If Microsoft suddenly says, oh, well, uh, by the way, we have to raise the cost of Windows to you. For uh, no particular reason. Good yeah, day. I would just get with the suing at that point. Yeah, but people have tried that before and it's tough to do. Yeah, well, whatever. Okay, so speaking of Microsoft, they Ooh, just... Ooh, segue. Yeah, they just got punned in court for the largest patent settlement in a... What was suit. it, like $1.3 billion? It was some ridiculous amount of money, over a billion dollars. For infringing upon a MP3-related patent lawsuit. Now, wait a minute, Scott. Doesn't Fraunhofer own the MP3 patent? Fraunhofer does own the MP3 patent. Well, well, the, well here's the thing. Because didn't Microsoft pay Fraunhofer? Something like that. The way What happens here is things like JPEG or GIF or MP3 or, I don't know, uh, cell phone radios or all kinds of technologies these days are so complex that they're not just covered by one patent. It's not like Edison where it was like, I invented the light bulb, one patent for the light bulb. Or Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, patent for the telephone. Yep, like MP3, you love like the patent for the special algorithm and method they use and a patent for yeah, it'll the... Yeah, the, there'll be a patent for the encoding, a patent for the decoding, a patent for this... You know, the, the encoder will have like five separate algorithms in it that go one after the other and two of them at the same time. That's like 10 patents right there. It's now, ridiculous. That wouldn't be an issue normally because you know generally one consortium or one company would own all these patents. So then you just have to pay them license fees in bulk and then you can use the thing. Yep. So, for example, uh, like HD, DVD, and Blu-ray, those are there's consortiums around those things. You know, a bunch of companies get together. They come up with some standard technology. They get as many patents on it as possible. And if you want to license that technology, you license from the Blu-ray consortium. And then they d decide how they divide the monies among the consortium members. Which, while it, it's definitely a workaround of the fairly broken software patent system, in the very least, it shields normal people and normal companies who just want to use technology from all that patent BS. Yeah, imagine what would happen if, say, let's say Sony and um, Toshiba, which are like enemies, but let's say they got together and made a technology. And part of the technology is made by Sony and part was made by Toshiba. And half the patents are on one side and half are on the other. Well, now if Sony wants to use technology, they have to license those patents from Toshiba. And if Toshiba wants to use the license from Sony, and if you want to use the technology, now you have to pay both of them. You have to come up with two separate agreements to two separate companies. Now imagine if five companies made the technology together. It's out of control. So uh, what happened with Fraunhofer and MP3? Well, basically everyone... Everyone who knows anything about MP3s, if you wanted to license MP3 technology, you would pay Fraunhofer because it was sort of assumed, you know, by most of the world that Fraunhofer had all the MP3 patents. Well, now, notice the word assumed. This, the patent system is far too complex. But anyway. Yeah. Well, uh, Lucent slash Alcatel. Alcatel? Altel? I don't know. Alcatel, I think. Alcatel. I, I read the article Slash yesterday. Bell Labs, slash Fraunhofer, slash a bunch of companies. When MP3 was made, there's been a lot of shuffling since then. You know, and Fraunhofer is kind of its own thing now, and Bell Labs is, it, who knows who owns that now. This and, happens a lot in the technology sector, where a company gets bought out, and then split up, and then the two split off parts get bought by two different companies, and then a third company merges with one of them, and... Yeah, and every time companies split up and get together or get bought and merged, you know, all the patents belonging to the companies fly all over the place, you know? Like, when someone lets go of a company, they keep some of the patents and some of them get stay with the thing, and then someone buys it and they get all the patents. Yep, in the end, there are a lot of patents out there that... While someone will claim to have them, the status is actually ambiguous, and no court has said who owns it, and no one actually agrees. It just hasn't come up as an issue. Yep. So, the in the MP3 patent portfolio, which is all the patents that are for MP3, it seems like one of the patents may or may not have slipped through the cracks to Lucent slash Alcatel, which is the company that, you know, is some way connected to Bell Labs, Fraunhofer, or something. So... 
they decided, hey, we found this, you know, some lawyer at Loose and Alcatel said, hey, we got this one patent here that might be related to MP3 that fell through the cracks somehow. It's, you know, uh, all those people who are using MP3 only paid Fraunhofer and they didn't pay us. Let's see if we can take them to court. Oh, I got an idea. Let's just go after Microsoft. That's a good one to go after. Oh, yeah, let's go after Microsoft. All right. Now, Microsoft probably gets this and goes, what the fuck is this, you Charles? I paid Fraunhofer. Yeah, but it's like, aha, uh-huh, we had one of the patents that, you know, Fraunhofer needs for to get the all MP3 patent. Now, we have a small part. In a rational- it's Imagine if, like, you had the telephone patent, but I had the patent on the thing that the- turns the electrical signal into sound. Or if you had a patent on the buttons on the telephone. Yeah, I had, not- a bu- I had a, pa- a patent on the layout of the buttons. So, aha, uh-huh, every phone with this layout of buttons must pay me money. Yeah. Now, furthermore, you wait until everyone has a telephone, and then suddenly you say, by the way, I got this patent, assholes. Yeah. So some judge who probably doesn't understand technology and is a dumbass decided that Microsoft was the lose and that this patent was the real. Now, this is what bothers me. I mean, imagine if the world were run by common sense or if people just sat down and thought about it. Most people in the world who had anything to do with this industry, agreed that the patent liabilities were taken care of by payments to X company. People had been paying X company. There was great precedent that everyone had been paying X company for Y patent. Suddenly, someone comes along and says, no, I have the patent due to this loophole. It's like back in medieval times when someone would be like, well, technically, I'm the second son of the first Earl of the blah, 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 and therefore I am the real king of Spain. I mean, really, think about this. This isn't even a case like a patent case that would make sense. Like, aha, I actually invented the light bulb a year ago. You know, I did something. I deserve the money for this invention because I'm the inventor. This is, haha, I have a piece of paper. Give me a lot of money. It, it's basically you deserve nothing. You're just someone who came out of nowhere with a piece of paper declaring that somehow some company that knows nothing about you owes you one and a half billion dollars. This is right down there with what Rambus did with their Ram back in the day. Yeah. Where they the, the, the whole submarine patent issue where you, you get a technology, you work with people, you give them technology, and you don't really mention that it's patented by you. You wait until they use it, and then you sue everybody in the world. <sighs> well... But well, hopefully this will go to a higher court who is not as dumb as this low court. I have a little bit of faith just because Microsoft has a lot of money. And normally, you know, you say, oh, Microsoft, what's a few million dollars? This is way more money than that. This, this is-, is over a billion dollars. And, and it would have been, according to the letter of the law, the, set, the amount of money could have been four times as much if Microsoft had willfully infringed the patent. So if Microsoft was purposefully infringing on the patent. Like, we're going to infringe on that patent. We don't care. It would have been like $5 billion. Microsoft is not going to take this sitting down. They're not stupid. And uh, it's weird that I have to root yeah, for Microsoft I mean, think about in this. a patent issue. I don't Think about this, though, right? If, the, if they're suing you for a billion-something dollars, right? That means spending $100 million on lawyers isn't a bad idea. Guess what? You're not going to win because Microsoft <laughs> can spend... $200 million on lawyers, and they'll still be getting a good deal on this one. I don't think anyone can beat $200 million of lawyers. That basically like every lawyer in the world versus your one law firm. <laughs> <laughs> Unless, I mean, you've got to see what law firm they'll have I mean, on their side. For that much money, you could buy the patent office from the government and then go into the files and switch them around. <laughs> Things of the day. Now, Scott was thinking about doing a theme week, and I totally jumped on the bandwagon because I actually had one of the things he was talking about on my computer. Basically, I remembered seeing, or hearing, I forget, the uh, opener to Pokemon in Hebrew. Now, I figured, hey, that's pretty cool. That makes a good thing of the day, you know, because normally you only hear it in Japanese and English. And I don't know, well, I guess some people from this, you know, for uh, who listen to this podcast are from other countries. So they may or may not have seen openers to uh, popular shows in their native language. So all this week, I decided I'm going to find some openers and maybe some other uh, instances of cartoons or popular shows of uh, geeks. In- yeah, it's not going to be just anime and yeah, cartoons. That are uh, in various languages. Because, you know, it's pretty funny. I mean, if you watch, like, Family Guy in Spanish. Doma, 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 doma. Yeah, Quagmire doesn't say giggity, giggity. He says doma, 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 doma. Giggity, 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 Yeah, so it's pretty cool. So 
uh, I went and I talked to some people, like Anime World Order people, and they suggested I give you the Macron 1 opener in Hebrew. It's pretty funny. It's pretty funny because the original opener to Macron 1 has like a robot voice that says, well, the English opener, not the Japanese opener, has a robot voice that says, ma 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 Macron 1. It's kind of lame. Yeah. So the Hebrew one actually has a a pleasant woman singing the same thing, only she says ma 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 Macron echad, because echad is one. In, <laughs> it's echad, time shalosh. I forget, but that's one, two, three. I learned that from Futurama. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's where how I learned yeah. how to count a little bit in Hebrew. So it's pretty. Uh, it's pretty funny. <laughs> it's a good opener. Oh, and the first half of the opener has a lot of Hebrew talking, and you can learn how to tell when. I mean, Hebrew Hebrew is sort of a caveman language. Like <laughs> the grammar is sort of like like if you want to say who is that, it's like he ata. Which is pretty much like, who that? Ata. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a caveman language, but you can. it's pretty interesting to listen to people speak it. So here's your chance if you've never heard people speak Well, the thing is, Hebrew it's always before. bothered me that they even bother to localize and change the music like that in shows. I mean... Actually, I think the Hebrew one is better. It's oh, yeah, it version. is. I, I agree, actually. <laughs> but just, it, it's funny that, like Sailor Moon, when they brought it over to America, they really tried to make it an American show, and they tried to remove any reference that it was happening in Japan, despite the fact that there's a red and white Eiffel Tower in the background all the time. Yeah, what's that doing there? Yeah, Yeah, it's like, they. I mean, the fact that they would still do it, because a lot of modern shows, they still do this. It's like, what do you think, kids are stupid? Yeah, of course, then again. No, everybody knows. You're not fooling anybody when you do that. Then again, when I was a really little kid, there were cartoons from Japan that I didn't know were from Japan. Well, like, I didn't know the cartoons were from Japan, but if the cartoon took place in Japan, I totally knew, you know? And a lot of times, the cartoons didn't actually take place in Japan or America. Like, Macross slash Robotech takes place on an island, a random island. And, uh, like... What else is a good one? Transformers obviously takes place in America. I mean, look, Spike is so white. You're not telling me he's a Japanese <laughs> guy. So it's like, you know. Anyway, back in high school, when I got a hold of Japanese music, because the internet started having MP3s on it, and the first thing, God, the, I'm not going to get into that whole story, but one of the early songs I acquired was the Chinese opener to Sailor Moon. And it was kind of weird sounding because I'd never heard Chinese music before. I'd just gotten used to Japanese music. And now I hear people singing in Chinese and it sounded just really weird to me. Because back then I didn't even really watch or know about Chinese kung fu movies. So I was doubly in the dark. And I had it and now that it's the thing of the day, I, so I went think, I wonder, huh? I wonder if anyone's ever put this on YouTube. And I to look on YouTube and sure enough, there are multiple openers and closers to Sailor Moon in Chinese. And I've linked to one of them as my thing of the day. Yeah, the nay, whole week nay, is going to be like go this, ha. people. So watch out. Yeah. Anyway, for anyone who listened to the most recent episode of this show, the Monday episode that we did last, which was, what, two weeks ago? Maybe. I don't remember. Yeah, we talked about layers two and three, you know, IP addresses and MAC addresses, in layman's terms, how networking works on that low level. You know, there are five layers in TCP IP, which is what you all use. And we talked about layers two and three. Layer one is the physical wire, which you don't really don't care about at all. Tonight, we were going to talk about NAT, which is that thing that you have in all your Linksys routers. And almost all of you use it. You probably don't really know what it does. and You probably don't really care. And we were going to talk about that. But then we realized that there's one critical thing that you have to understand before we can explain how NAT works in any real way. Thus, tonight, what we wanted to do is cover the next layers up. Instead of layers two and three, we want to talk about layers four and five. Now, to refresh it real quick, layer two was MAC addresses. Layer three was IP addresses. Layer four, which I'm sure you've heard this term before, is what we like to call ports. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, basically, before you know about ports, which I'm sure you've heard analogies of ports that we are going to repeat to you pretty soon... There are sort of things under ports that you have to know, such as packets. Like, now, what is a packet? Last time we talked about IP addresses. Now, once you know someone's IP address, your the stuff you were sending can be routed over the internet to that person. So the internet knows where to send your data. So if I ask for 129.21.21.1, the internet sends all my data there. 
Now, if this were a telephone system, it would basically... Well, now it doesn't really work that way because it's digital. But back in the day, the telephone system would have a bunch of switches that would connect your phone physically via one long switched wire all the way to that other phone. And you just send data over what is effectively a long wire. It's like a permanent wire going between the two of you until you hang up. Well, it is. You know, if you, you well, dial, until you hang up. Yeah. Then it's not permanent anymore. That's right. You would dial a phone number, and then there would be a physical wire connecting you and another person, a really long one, on the phone poles. And that's why you would see all those old videos of the, the phone operators switching all these wires in different holes to physically connect two people. Now, if you are the only two people sharing a physical wire... You could just talk on that wire all day long. You can't talk to anyone else, but you can talk to the person on the other end of the wire all day. You know, you're connected perfectly. You don't have to keep saying, you know, who. You don't have to, like, say. Well, no, it's like uh, you've probably all heard of ISDN lines and all that. I mean, on the phone system, you can set up even now a direct permanent connection between two points. It's as though a phone on one end called a phone on the other end and is always connected 24-7. Yeah, you don't have to, every time you say something on the phone, you don't have to say who to send it to because there's only one way it can go, the other end of the wire where the listener is. Now, IP addresses theoretically could work in a similar way where when you go to an IP address, the internet would make a path, a physical wire, to connect the two points to send your data. Yeah, so if I want to visit Dig, they could have decided when they made the internet... To make a tube. Yep, the way we're going to do it is to make a tube between me and Dig, and I can talk to Dig, and Dig can talk to me over this wire, and I can't talk to anyone else while I'm talking to Dig unless I have more wires, and that's how it works. Now, considering how many computers there are on the internet, this, th- I think it's obvious why that fails miserably. Yeah, you would need so many wires. I mean, imagine if a thousand people came to your website and you didn't have a thousand wires. Oops. Uh-oh. So what we do, now we're not going to talk about this in detail. We just need you to understand what this is on a basic level. We'll do a show someday about more details. But it's called packetization. You don't send a straight stream of data. You send data in discrete things called packets, little bursts of data where you know exactly how big they are, and they contain inside of them all the information to get from point A to point B. So instead of, you know, I throw a wire to you and you grab it, and then we talk, you know, with the two tin cans and we can't talk to anyone else, basically we have these mailboxes, and the mailman visits all the goddamn time. And I, you know, I want to write you a letter. I write a part of the letter, put an envelope. Write a part of the letter, put an envelope. Write a part of the letter, put an envelope. I want to send a letter to someone else. I put a different address on the envelope, and I put a different piece of thing in there. It says lots and lots of little bits of information that all get sent on their own to different addresses, and they arrive at different addresses. And you just mail them out, and you get them in, and then you sort them out once you get them. See, now the mail analogy, at least for what we're talking about right now, is extremely good, and I recommend that you try to think of all of this in terms of mail. Packets are envelopes. There's data in them, but the envelope as a whole is sent. You might have two different letters in the envelope. You might have two different paragraphs on each page, but no one cares about that because the envelope itself is sent as a whole from point A to point B. Now, as a result, you don't need a specific path between any two points open all the time. You can just route the envelopes along the same paths and then branch them off with logic depending on where they go. Yep, you don't know what the mailman's doing with your envelope once you give it to him. And you don't know how the envelopes that are showing up at your door got there. All you know is that they did. And they probably didn't go straight to where they were supposed to go. You don't think the mailman drove from your house to the other guy's house. He probably stopped at some other houses and dropped them off at a sorting facility. And then they got sent somewhere else, and then they got some somewhere else. Only they're doing it wicked fast, speed yep. of light fast. And you might send two letters to the same person, and they both take two different routes, but they both get there. And they might. who knows what order they're going to get there. I could send you something yesterday, and I could send you something today, and the thing I send you today gets there right away, and the thing I sent yesterday gets there tomorrow. Who knows? So, all right, back to the computer realm then. You know, you're sending your data to an IP address. Now, I'm playing Quake, and I'm connected to a Quake server. So I know their IP address, and they know mine. So I'm sending data to them, packets, and they're sending packets back to me, and everything's great. All the packets I get, I send to the Quake program. All the packets they get, they send to the Quake server. Now, what if, while I'm playing Quake, I also have AOL Instant Messenger open? Now I'm getting packets to my computer, my IP address, my address, which is the same for everyone. It's like my street address. I'm getting packets from AOL to my AOL thing, and I'm getting packets from the Quake server to my Quake thing. 
but they all arrive at the same IP address. How does my computer know to send the packet for the AOL thing to the AOL program and the packet to the Quake thing to the Quake program? Oh, it's a good problem. I mean, plus, what if the Quake server has, say, a web server on it? How does it not know not to send you web pages when you're asking for where the guy is or who you just fragged? Yeah, I mean, what if you have a computer that's running a web server and a file transfer server, FTP, and a Jabber server? All the packets are still going to the same IP address. Yeah, one computer is usually one IP address. Now, the answer here is that there is another number. It's called a port. I'm sure you've heard of it before. I'm sure a lot of you have had a lot of problems trying to make BitTorrent work, and it asks you to pick a port for something, or you've got NAT, and it says to open up a port between two things. We're going to explain what ports are. They're layer four. They are the transport layer. See, this layer two, you know, the data link layer, you can link two computers together. Layer three was the uh, network layer. You can link two computers together over a network. They don't have to be in the same neighborhood. Layer four, you can link two programs together on two computers over a network through a data link. This is all accomplished with the port numbers. So when you connect to something, you're not actually just connecting to the IP address. If you go into your web browser and type an IP address into it to get somewhere, it assumes the web browser that you want to connect to port 80, which is commonly the web port it's the port where http web pages are served where web servers run yeah i mean when you start your web server your apache or your iis or whatever program you have for the web server or your web browser they just decide they're going to use 80 as the port however you could very well decide that you're going to use some other port you could tell your web server hey web server don't use 80 use uh, 10,000. So then anyone who wanted to connect to your web page would have to know that you're on a weird port and would have to tell the web browser or whatever they're using to connect specifically to do, go to that port because by default, all web browsers go to port 80. Yep, so even though your computer might have a web server running, if it's not on 80, then the web, the web browser comes and tries to knock on door number 80 and nobody's home. And they, you know, they have to tell the web browser, no, knock on door 10,000 this time. That's where the web server's at. So say you got your envelope and the IP address is analogous to your house address. And say you have three people living in your house. The name on the envelope is like the port. So it goes to my house, the geek house, and then it says RIM on it, which means, all right, it is for port RIM. It goes to the application RIM as opposed to the application Scott. If you don't say what port, then it's not really going to get anywhere because no one's listening for it. Yeah, I mean, if someone sends a letter to our house that has our address on it and it says for... Joe? Joe doesn't live here. We're just going to throw it out. Yeah, or ignore it, or return it back to sender. Or something like that. Or like, what if, you know, send something for RIM, but RIM moved out. There was a web server here a few seconds ago, but it, it crashed, or it, it turned it off. Well, then now he goes in the trash, just like the Joe's mail goes. So you might have seen the notation. Typically, people write ports, it'll be IP address, you know, number dot number dot number dot number, colon, and then the port number. That's what people usually do to... I mean, there are other standards, it doesn't really matter. Usually, for most of your daily use, you'll never even need to know what port, because Telnet is always on port 23, and all Telnet programs assume that, and SSH is always on its port, and HTTP is always on its port, and NTP is always on its port. Yeah, people have sort of decided, like, you know, different programs will always, you know, they pick a port number when they make the program, and then those programs seem to always use that same number. So, 90% of the time... You're not going to have to know anything because the AIM program automatically connects to the AIM server on the default AIM port. It knows the number. You I don't think have to tell it. I think it's 617, but I'm totally guessing on yeah, that. Yeah, like, like what's the, the all the Half-Life uh, servers, Counter-Strike servers? Yeah, like, yeah. What, 27915 maybe? I don't remember the number. See, now luckily, you out there, for the most part, don't really need to know what ports you're using because that's all under the covers. It's all assumed. It's all standard. You only need to worry about it with things like BitTorrent and NAT, which we'll get to at the end of this episode. Yep. And NAT, we'll get to in another show. But all right, you have, since we're talking about ports, we can tell you a lot more about ports, and I promise we won't get technical. Mm -hmm. But a port is just a number. It goes next to an IP address. You know, IP address is the address, port is the name. Ports range from 0 to 65,535. Yep, so if you had... Uh, 70,000 different programs. You couldn't start 70,000 different web servers on your computer. Eventually, you would run out of ports. This almost never happens because no one does 70,000 web servers on one computer. Yep, and even then, there are ways around that. 
uh, just in case anyone with technical knowledge is listening to this, they're crazy, interesting, and mostly theoretical and not practical. And mostly practical. not useful because who the hell has 70,000 web servers on one computer? However, port multiplexing does have useful purposes, but again, that's well beyond the scope of what we're talking about tonight. <laughs> yes. So ports range from that number to that number, that big range. There's a lot of ports. And much like, remember how IP addresses were way back in the day broken up into class A, class B, all the way through class E? Well, ports are broken up in a similar fashion. The first 1,023 port, well, the first 1,024 ports, so port 0 through port 1,023. If you're wondering why these numbers are weird, they're it's because they're in two. binary. They're powers of 2, because computers like to think in powers of 2. Yep. So those first 1,000 or so ports are known as the commonly used ports because they've been used for the same programs pretty much as long as ports have existed. Yeah, this is where you're going to find all the really low numbers, like your FTP, your Telnet, your SSH, HTML, your HTML, HTTP, not HTML. Yeah, HTTP. HTTP. All the weird ones that no one uses, like Echo or Character Generator or Daytime. Or uh, Netcat, I think. And, now, these yeah. ports are special. Now, ports are regulated, but they're not... There's no enforcement. It's not like you can go to jail if you use ports incorrectly. But by and large, the world as a whole recognizes and respects the rules for using ports. Now, the, these first set of ports are special in a number of ways. Aside from the fact that they're commonly known and they never change. So, you know, Telnet will always be port 23. Most... Good operating systems and secure operating systems, Linuxes and all, Unixes and all that, will not yet let a non-super user put anything on those ports. So a non-super user cannot listen on one of those ports, which adds a small bit of security to where you can trust that at least if you're connecting to one of those ports on a machine, a super user has blessed the usage of that port. Now that is not always the case in modern times, and as technologies advance. That is becoming less and less of a followed standard, but suffice to say, that is an interesting thing that you might want to keep in mind. It might help you out someday. Yeah, I mean, the idea is that, you know, a lot of the things you're going to be doing on low-numbered ports, like SSHs, are things that need to be secure. So if the person on the other end has something on port, you know, a port 22, the SSH port, you can be kind of sure that what's on the other end is actually SSH and not some evil person up to no good. Yep. Now, beyond that, these are all generally low-level things. You know, terminal servers, character generators, basic, basic stuff. The next set up, up until uh, 12,000 and something, I forget exactly what number it is, it doesn't matter. Those are known as the registered ports, or the allocated ports. And these are the ones that you use for most applications. You know, Quake 2, or Half-Life, or AIM, or all these programs. You know, your print server, or your Samba, or all that kind of stuff. They register with uh, various or, uh, bodies as to what port they want, and it's semi-regulated. There are a few conflicts here and there, but for the most part, it's solid. So if it's registered, say I have a program called FooBit, and it does whatever. It, does, it, it sends bits filled with ASCII characters that spell out Foo. That's all it does. If I get it registered to, say, port uh, 2,999, I don't know what's actually on port 2,999, then generally, anyone else who makes a program would never make their program listen on that port. That way, when I have my program and you install it and run it, I can make my program assume that it'll always listen on that port. And anyone making firewall rules can always assume that anyone using that program will want to have that port open for incoming packets. Yeah, because I mean, imagine this. Imagine if there was no regulation at all, right? Now, I run a program on my computer, and I don't want to, I'm a dumb user, so I don't know anything about ports. I don't want to have to type in port numbers or manually configure port numbers for different things. So I just want to let everything decide what port to use on its own. So let's say I run a web server and then I run a Quake server. And the web server people never talk to the Quake people. They both just decided to use port 80 on their own. Now, don't we have a problem? Yes, we do. Oh, shit. See, now that's another reason why originally, and hope, I don't know how long this will stick around, but the first thousand ports or so are special and only super users can mess with them. That very much limits the number of people who can cause a problem. More people can mess with the registered ports, but at least there's a list out there of what's on each port. It's also useful if you're doing debugging. If you see a, a weird port number, you can look it up and see generally what program would be listening on that port. Now, the final set of ports, they're called the ephemeral ports or the dynamic ports, are all the rest, all the way up to 65,535. These ports are throwaways. 
When, Because remember, you need a port on both ends, much like an IP address. So say I want to connect to Scott's Telnet server on port 23. So I have to send my packet from my computer and from a port on my computer. Now, I'm not going to send it from my Telnet port, port 23, because then how am I going to get responses back? And how can I tell if those responses are someone else trying to Telnet to me versus Scott's Telnet trying to talk back to me? So what I do is I connect to Scott on his port 23 from my port whatever. I pick a random ephemeral port. Like 43,211. There are algorithms for picking these ports. Usually the operating system or the stack will decide which port. doesn't really matter, but it'll pick a random port that nothing else on your computer is using, and it'll send the message from that port to Scott's port 23. Now, Scott's Telnet server sees this and knows, all right, Any communication going back to this person will go to port that whatever random port. And that port will stay open until my conversation with Scott's Telnet is done. It's it's sort of like if I want to send mail to someone just just now, you know, I got to do something right now with that person. I business with them only for a short time. I'm just going to temporarily open up this P.O. box over here with some random number and all the mail in this, you know, particular item of business will be in this one P.O. box. And so they know where to contact me, and I know where to contact them. And everything's cool. And then when I got business with them no more, I'll just close that P.O. box. I don't need it. Now, there's a lot more to this than all that. I mean, we, you've, you got the basics, the port numbers. That's all you need to know. But the consequences of these ports are far-reaching. Like, you might have heard about firewalls. People talk about having a firewall. Very simply and very briefly, just to get an idea of why ports are important... If you make a firewall, a a basic firewall, what it does is it looks at traffic coming in, and in many cases, it'll look at the port numbers, and it'll say, I will only let traffic coming in on ports 23 and 80 in, and anything else will be blocked no matter what. So knowing how ports work, firewall operators can set up firewalls that will allow in traffic on ports they want and not allow in traffic on ports they don't want, and yet still allow communication to take place in two directions. Yep, this is how you can set up like your company's network to let your employees go to websites but not use AIM, you know, to do stuff like that. Yep. Uh, If you guys are interested, again, post in the forums. We can talk in great detail about security and firewalls and all that business. Stateful and stateless, PIX firewalls, all the fun stuff. But that's well beyond the scope of tonight, and I don't think anyone listening now really wants to hear it. Man, a whole bunch of stuff is way beyond our scopes. Yeah, suffice to say, if you're interested, keep letting us know. We're probably going to do another series of everything we've been talking about these past few weeks. One level of tech up from what we're doing now. Yeah, someday. Anyway, the beginning of the episode, or early in the episode, we talked about how it's packet switching and routing, as opposed to the old style of actual, there's a physical wire between you and them switching and routing. This is what makes the internet awesome. Without packet switching... The internet would be completely useless, and we, none of the stuff we have today would exist. This is a fundamental concept that is why the internet is awesome. Now, we also mentioned that you're putting stuff in envelopes and sending them to IP addresses and ports, and you're getting stuff, but I said, you don't know if stuff's going to get here today or tomorrow, when it's going to get here, what order it's going to get there in. You don't know if it's going to get there at all. So what do we do about this? Well... There are two answers. One answer is you don't do anything about it. The other answer is you do do something about it. Now, again, we're talking about the way most of you use computers, which is with something called TCP IP, which is the stack we're talking about. You know, I keep saying the layer numbers, layer one, two, three, four, five. We're talking about layer four now. In TCP IP, layer four is broken up into two distinct protocols, two ways of using ports. Now, the only reason we're going to talk about this is because a lot of programs will ask for a port, but they'll ask for a TCP port as opposed to a UDP port, because there are, in fact, two different kinds of ports in TCP IP. Yeah, well, when you make a port, well, it's sort of like it's sort of like the same set of ports, but when you open up a port, you have it, they're like doors. When you open one up, you decide if it's going to be a TCP or a UDP port. You know, you can't open up the same port as TCP and UDP at the same time, really. That doesn't work. But you pick one, so... Sometimes you need both. You just open up two doors. One is the TCP door and one's the UDP door. So what is the difference between TCP and UDP? UDP is the one where you don't care. If you open up a UDP port, you just send packets with addresses on them. You don't care if they get there. You don't care what order they get there in. You just send them. 
You send them all you want, and sometimes you get some. And when you get them, you have to recognize that you don't know what order they were sent in. You don't know if there are any missing. You just got them. Why would you want to do this? Well, there's a very good reason why you'd want to do this. Let's say you're using, I don't know, Skype. Skype is a perfect example of why UDP is awesome. Even though it sounds like a pile of crap, why would you do that? If you're using Skype, you're talking to someone. You're turning your audio voice into bits, and you're, set, you're turning the bits into a bunch of packets, and you just send them. And if they show up in the wrong order, just throw out the ones that are in the wrong order. Yeah, getting a port, like playing a game, too, and a game of Quake. If a packet arrives late after you've already packed, like say someone's shooting at you and one of the packets in that sequence is missing, the game's gone on and now that packet arrives. That data's already useless. You don't care anymore. You've already implemented whatever error correction algorithm or however you're going to deal with that problem you have. The information can't help now because the situation's already passed. You don't need that packet. You don't want that packet. You don't want to respond to that packet or even look at it. Yep. I mean... Would you rather sit around, like, let's say I'm talking to Rim on Skype, right? And one packet gets lost. You want to wait around for that packet to show up again? Your Skype conversation is going to be all shaky. It's much better to just leave that tiny nanosecond of audio, you know, empty or just de- fake the quality of it and just keep going to get the conversation and the, the sound to just keep going and streaming so you can keep hearing something. As, you know, whatever packets make it, make it. Because, you know, while you can't guarantee the stuff is going to happen, the stuff gets there. The internet is miraculously reliable in some fashion. And if you send a bunch of packets on UDP, you know, sure, I guess it's possible that none of them could make it to the other side. But for the most part, they make it. Skype works. The, The packets will get there and you can hear something. It's just if stuff's missing, that's actually better for something like Skype or streaming video you know if the if the quality of the video goes down a bit or if half the video is missing for a second it's not gonna be much better than to have the video skip in and stop in and whatnot now let's say you are trying to send a file to someone meaning all the bits have to get there in order if any bit is missing the file is garbage and useless or let's say i'm sending an instant message to rim i want the instant message to get there in the right order i want to be sure it got there And I don't want letters missing in the middle of my instant message, or else that's kind of useless. This is when you use the TCP. I'm not going to tell you how the TCP does its tricks. But basically, by sending a lot more information in the packets, and by checking to make sure they got there, you are guaranteed that if you are connected to someone on a TCP port, you are sort of guaranteed that either the connection's going to stop working, or... The stuff is going to get there, in the order you said. Now, you might not care about all that. All you really need to remember is that there are two different kinds of ports, TCP and UDP. Yep. TCP, guaranteed to get there. UDP, not so guaranteed to get there. So, of course, in... Now, one last thing, just so you're aware. Now, UDP also... Remember, we talked about the layers. Quick refresher. You know, layer one is the physical layer, the wire, uh, or the wireless, or whatever physical way you send the ones and zeros over space. A wire up Rim's butt, and then he yells the data out of his mouth. Yes, yeah. that's an excellent <laughs> protocol. It is. Quite fantastic. <laughs> layer two is the data link layer. That was MAC addresses. That's how two computers can talk over that wire. Layer three is network layer. Layer four, which we just talked about, is ports. That's how you know which thing to talk to on a computer. The last layer, which we don't need to talk about, really, is layer five, the actual program. So if layer one is an Ethernet cable and layer two is, you know, MAC addresses, link, data link, all that. Layer three is IP addresses. Layer four is a TCP port. Layer five is my game of Quake 2. Yeah, uh, it's a game of Quake 2. It's Firefox. It's AIM. That, that's what it is. Yep. But remember, the, the, the program itself is putting data in these packets. Now, it can put whatever data it wants. So a nice example here, TFTP, the Trivial File Transfer Protocol is a file transfer protocol much like FTP, file transfer protocol. Only much simpler. Except to to skip over all the other interestingness of it, because it's actually a very useful protocol, it's meant to be very light, and it uses UDP. You might wonder, why on earth would it use UDP? How do you know the file got there? The answer is, instead of letting the network stack take care of that, the program itself puts its own data in the packet that it can then use on the other end to figure out if everything got there. Programs can do this on their own. 
The thing is, with these layers, you can offload that to one layer lower than the layer you're working on and then not have to worry about it. If you just want the data to get there and you don't want to have to sit there and write a way of figuring out if the data got there, you just use TCP and it's all taken care of for you in a relatively efficient manner. Or maybe you only care a little bit about whether the data got there and not super a whole lot whether the data got there. UDP doesn't care at all on its own and TCP super cares. So if you care a little bit, you can use UDP and then write your own thing that uses UDP and cares only a little bit about whether the data got there or not. Now, next week, unless we come up with something super awesome to talk about, and also because this has been requested quite a bit, now that we've done these previous two shows, anyone who's listened to both of them, you'll have enough of an idea of how all this networking stuff works to finally understand this. Next week, we're going to explain how NAT, that thing on your Linksys router that lets you have more than one computer on the internet, works. Yep. It's called Network Address Translation. Yes. Ooh. Which is in some ways almost a misnomer because there, it, it's actually usually pet or all. We won't get into that right now. We're not going to get into that. But there is a very important technology called NAT that is very important to understand. And also, in, in addition Without to Without it, we'd be fucked. In addition to just talking about how it works, we're going to talk about why it matters to you and how you can do that port forwarding business to make BitTorrent work. And also why you should probably have NAT even if you don't need the main purpose of it, because it has other purposes. Yes. Yeah. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an Odeo on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.